One of the most amazing things about Poulenc is how he created, and I tried to talk about this in the book, he created an image of himself, a type of myth of him being a very easy, very generous, very light-hearted, infinitely charming Maurice Chevalier-like individual. But I think it was you years ago who first pointed out to me that it had to be more complicated because of there is work which shows fear and angst. You mentioned the organ concerto, you mentioned Secheres. La Voix Humaine. La Voix Humaine. Yes, it's a piece entirely about nervous, nervous. I, I think you can't present that, let's say, false image to yourself without actually going slightly mad. And I think that the, the neurosis and I think is always there. And you talk about his bonhomie. I think that he presented this image which nobody believed. His friends knew exactly who he was and they forgave him everything because they loved him. Yeah. And I think, my God, maybe we all do that. We've got a, a version of ourselves that we present to people and to our friends. And no one buys it for a second apart from us. <laughs> but I, yes, but not being a friend of Poulenc and not having the advantage of seeing him off duty, like people like Henri oh, Songuet or Mio or people yes. like that, I did buy. I mean, when I was young, I thought, when I first met Poulenc, Poulenc's music, I never met him. I became very friendly with his family and goodness knows, I've, I've been at Moise and I've trodden the footsteps of reverence. But for me, when I was young, I thought, and of course I was dealing with documents like that first volume of letters, which is very censored. Yes, very. It was never hidden that he was a, a gay composer. I knew that very early on from someone like Felix Abraham and the great critic, who was a friend of Poulenc. So yes, he was gay, but complicatedly gay, unhappily gay, no idea um, that he was, I thought he was sort of slightly left-wing, slightly liberal. There are many indications that he was rather right-wing as a person, that he was extremely generous. There are other indications that he was rather mean. In other words, the whole picture of Poulant that actually comes out is only possible when you really begin to study, because I really did buy the image. And one of the reasons why I think it, his music is somehow underestimated as being serious is that a lot of other people thought that he was just a light-hearted, delightful joker. Flan flanner. Yes, a flanner. Yeah. Yes. A glass of white wine. No red wine of any serious vintage around. Thank you very much. And yet, I would say that some of the great songs um, are glasses of first growth clarets. I mean, they're not sort of light, sparkling, white wine. This is serious stuff. And it's getting people to take them seriously and to actually say profound. I remember a very uh, famous music critic called Joan Chisel, who wrote a book on Schumann. And I said, Poulenc at his most profound. And he said, Graham, you really can't use the word profound when it comes to Poulenc. And that was dyed in the wool perception with British people. Well, there's two areas with Poulenc where we can't deny his profundity. And the first is, 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 is the songs, I think, it's, and then also the religious music. And by religious music, I mean some of the songs. I mean Carmelites, the opera. I mean Salvat Master, the Gloria. And, but there, I think, is a place where he was able to ex express all his human emotions. So, fear. There's the fear of God, the fear of death, Timor uh, Tremens, it's all over the ether. And Carmelites is all about fear, anxiety, a lack of courage, not having the courage to, to face up to destiny, to death, all those things, which are very, very Poulenkian. Um, so th that religious music is throughout, and I find that, and you put me on the clue to that, in, in half of the songs. And I think people talk about this Janus Poulenc for some reason. It's such a cliche. This man who is, you know, the moine et voyou is what the French says. He's a monk and he's a ragamuffin, yeah? But I just see, I always think of Walt Whitman's line, I cannot, I do not contradict myself, I contain multitudes. Mm -hmm. And I see Poulenc as someone who contains multitudes. He's as much a spiritual person as a, a sensual person as every person Practically, I know and love, and I call that normal.
But interestingly, with the songs, it, it really does spin for itself in a sort of Eluar, who's a poet we'll talk about, who corresponds to the philosophical Poulenc. I think he finds philosophy to understand his own emotions, fear, um, lack, of, lack of faith in his own ability. These come out from religious ideas. And the Polinaire, and I think and the Polinaire is a, is a different sort of person to Eluar. And <clears throat> we could talk about two couple of masterpieces, uh, Tu vas le faire du soir, which is a, a, an Eluar song, which is long and gorgeous. Dans le jardin d'Anna, for about the same time, pretty much, a few, few years difference, that's an, an Apollinaire song, same length probably, same number of pages probably, but a different container, isn't it? Um, they're two different um, uh, settings for jewels, if you like. And the Eluar songs, for me, are the, the setting for all these images, which are strange and surreal, just like Apollinaire, are within philosophical ideas, truth, beauty, love, all those things. And, and you won't get an Apollinaire song like uh, Nous avons fait la nuit, which is the last song of Telle Jour, Telle Nuit, that love song. That's not an Apollinaire song, it never would be. Um, <clears throat> so unsurprisingly, in the Eluar songs, there's this disparate images, surreal images, but within love, within hope, within the basics of humanity, men, women, love, bodies, um, breasts, heads, all those wonderful, beautiful things. But, uh, but there's very rarely a geographical or historical context. You yeah. go to the Apollinaire songs and we are in the, the Grenouillère, a beautiful song. We're, we're in, on, the, on, the, on the Grand Jatte, we're, we're, we're sort of all in, in Paris in the 1880s, probably. Dans le Jardin d'Anna, we're going back in history. In, we're in Strasbourg, we're in Amsterdam. And, there's, and very often also the poet is there in those songs. He's there in Montparnasse, isn't he? Little, little bit, bit player. He's there in Rosemonde chasing girls. So in the Polinaire song, there is a historical context and a geographical context and love and sex within there. And in the Elua songs, I think, there is... Uh, spiritual context. I think the only song of Apollinaire that is borderline Elua is Song Blue. Yes. That is the last of the Banalite cycle. Absolutely right. Or maybe some of Caligar, maybe Voyage, something like that. Yes. But um, it is, I think what I have to say is that Poulenc was remarkably influenced by what I call the real world. I mean, he went out every night of his life. He was incredibly social. He loved having people. He loved talking to people. He loved making friends. And if he decided he was going to make friends with you, it was the very rare person who didn't capitulate. Yes. Um, very few people dumped him, even though he was naughty and sometimes very naughty in terms of how he treated people. But there was an underlying loyalty that is a remarkable sign for people like me who didn't know him that he engendered that kind of affection. But what I will say is that just as Benjamin Britten would never have written Peter Grimes without having met a young tenor called Peter Piers, who in a sense um, changed his life both emotionally and musically, because emotionally and musically is the same thing when you are actually living at that level. Yes. Meeting someone called Pierre Bernac in 26, not a success, one a baritone, rather prim, rather intellectual, quite religious, and Poulenc was already having an enormously happy time in the 1920s, being outrageous. But when they met again, it's no secret that the first Eluard cycle was the cycle that was written for their debut as a duo. And there's something about Bernac being able to handle Elua and do it, that's also part of the equation. Yes. I mean, basically, they were not lovers. Yeah. I've had to tell people that so many times. They imagine there's a parallel situation between Peter Pierce and Benjamin Britten, Pierre Bernac and Francis Poulin. It's not the case. But what is a lover? A lover is a person who shares your life. In many ways, Bernac shared Poulin's life. There was absolutely never anything other than vous between them, no tutoyer. But he writes up to Bernard, and when Bernard leaves the stage in 1959, 
we are not given comparable song cycles. Not. And I think that the Peter Pears connection is so interesting. <clears throat> and the differences are not interesting at all. Yeah. The fact they weren't lovers, the fact they didn't have sex. I mean, I don't know about Pears and Britain and their sex life, I have no idea. But uh, it's, it's, uh, what's important is that this voice is not just uh, Benlach's voice, it's Poulenc's voice. Likewise, Pears, that's Britain's voice. Yeah. And, and I think if you're a composer, of course you're selfish, because you have to do the things that make you do what you do. If you're a star, I, I work a lot with actors, and I look at stars, um, and what they do is they steal energy from everyone on the stage, greedily and avariciously and meanly and selfishly, and give it to the audience. And I think great composers are like that. Britain's like that. He'll take whatever he needs and he gives it to us. And Poulenc is the same. Poulenc needs to write this music, particularly you say the Eloir songs, round about that time when, when he's the oldest enfant terrible on the block. He really is. I mean, he's, he's knocking on and you can't be a wunderkind forever because no. it's unbecoming. It's unbecoming. And, and the times didn't allow because the 30s were infinitely more serious and dangerous than the 20s. Absolutely. The 20s, and when Poulenc starts, everyone's died in the war. Yeah. The kids inherit the earth. The Cocteaus and the Poulenx, who, has, who are 16, 17, come on board and suddenly think, well, we're the kings of the castle. And more than that, we write circus music, we write popular music, we write polkas, we're anti Wagner, we're anti Ravel, we're anti Debussy. And suddenly the field was theirs. Yes, I've got somewhere here that extraordinary 